Well, some men love the ocean and spend a life at sea. I need a forest, a life in the trees. Home is where the heart is. Find your heart a good home. My heart is in the woodland, lost and alone. Deep in the woods where the highway can't be heard, I hear the sound of quiet in the absence of words. Corner I belong, I belong there still God made me a ridge runner in these rolling hills When I was a young lad my parents told me then Go out in the woods and find yourself young man First it was to hunt and fish, but deeper lessons came Here I sit all grown up, I'm searching just the same Deep in the woods where the highway can't be heard I hear the sound of quiet in the absence of words Former I belong, I belong there still God made me a ridge runner in these rolling hills Mountains are a mystery the longer you stay They'll roll their way in your soul deeper each day Even if you leave, they'll remain in your heart In the way the world sees you, how you see the world Deep in the woods where the highway can't be heard I hear the sound of quiet in the absence of words Former I belong, I belong there still God made me a rich runner in these rolling hills So I don't know if you're just warming. A very brief introduction so you understand who your speaker is. My name is Van Wagner. I'm from Danville, Pennsylvania, and I teach high school in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, but uh, welcome some Danvillians here in the audience. I always kick off with uh, a mention that I was a Danville FFA student, and I ask my audiences, what's FFA? And I know some of you know. So let's hear it. What's FFA? Future Farmers of America. Future Farmers of America. Why do I throw that in my program? Just because I especially want young people to be aware of it. It's a wonderful organization. I hope your school district has it. And that's where I was first exposed to a possible career path of wildlife conservation. Because in the FFA, they have the wildlife conservation portion of it. And it really opened my mind up to the possibility of a career in it. And so I went off to Penn State. Boy, what a game that was last night. Uh, Penn State is where I majored in wildlife and fisheries. And, uh, I, I absolutely loved it, and here I am years later, I'm an environmental science teacher at Lewisburg High School, and my passion, as you can see, is environmental awareness and conservation, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, you folks are literally sitting in my grand old Opry. I mean, if you listen to the songs I sing, we've got wildlife in the background, trees around us changing colors, this is where I want to be singing the songs I write. Uh, I'm fortunate to be uh, selected as Conservation Educator of the Year in Schuylkill County when I taught in Pine Grove and twice in Union County. Uh, and most recently, I was honored by the uh, Pennsylvania Forestry Association with the Sandy Cochran Award for uh, Natural Resource Education. I'm not throwing that in the program so much to brag, so much as, you know what it serves? It serves as a reminder to me, the speaker, that there are people out there in Pennsylvania that have high expectations of me as a teacher. And that doesn't matter if I'm in my classroom in Lewisburg or here at the Game Lands with you all. And so I put that in there as a reminder that every chance to teach people, I need to rise to the occasion and be the most professional person I can. So that's why I throw that in there. I think the bigger thing that draws me to the story of elk here in Pennsylvania is the fact that I'm a sportsman. 
Forget the teaching. Forget the music. Forget the Penn State. Let's just go back to what do I do when I have free time? I go out in the woods with my boy. That's my son, Calvin. And he helped me get a fall bird a few seasons back. And then that's my son, Luke, who just turned nine years old this week. And he caught that bass on a stick, no joke, with like a little snag piece of string each shore and a rusty hook with a piece of corn or something on it. I couldn't believe my eyes. That's my brother, Ollie Wagner, who took him fishing that day. So folks, put all that in a pot and stir it up, and you get me, your guest speaker today. And uh, the Game Commission and I have kind of put this program together. They're the sponsor. The Game Commission's the uh, sponsor who's sending me all over the state to kind of help celebrate this 100th anniversary that we all share of bringing elk back in Pennsylvania. So that's my introduction in four minutes or less. What do you say we get into the story of elk now? I always like to kick off with a map so I can show my audiences the original range. Uh, and as you can see, the entire East Coast, for the most part, had elk. Now, there were certain areas that had more than others, but they were almost in every state on the East Coast, with very few exceptions. And I've had several biologists tell me, they said, Van, you see that western border? Ignore it. It's arbitrary. Because the elk, as we now understand, from the East Coast all the way to the Pacific Coast, they were the same species. And I want to make sure you heard what I just said, because what I just said contradicts almost everything in print. If you pick up books on the subject of elk, we still thought up until a few years ago that there were different genetic uh, species of elk. Wrong. The, the geneticists have now said by looking at the DNA evidence, the, the elk in New Jersey could have mated with the elk in California and made viable offspring, thus the definition of a species. But a good chance to pause, though, and make sure I don't want to mislead you and say they all look like clones of each other. No way. There were, there were variation in the populations. So let's look at human beings as a good example. We have humans with light skin. We have humans with dark skin. We have humans with red hair, blonde hair, black hair, you name it. Different color eyes. Uh, we are all the same species, though. We're homo sapiens. So you would see that same variation in some of the physical features of the elk in different regions of North America. But I did want to make sure you understand, contrary to what a lot of the books say, this was the same species from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast. Let's get into some of the early people that moved in here. If I could take you back in a time machine thousands of years ago, right after the last ice age when the glaciers receded, it wouldn't look like this. You wouldn't see trees. It looked like tundra. Glaciers receded to a tundra. Humans moved into that tundra. They were hunting caribou. They were hunting woolly mammoths. It's hard to believe we had those here. The elk didn't come until it started to become a coniferous forest. So the coniferous forest moved in, the humans were already here, the humans started hunting them. Food, clothing, tools. This is my friend David Ramsey, also known as Black Bear. And he's portraying a person in native costume. And in just a moment, you'll see me doing my best job flint napping. I'm an amateur flint napper. What that is, is when you take a, a piece of stone and you make a tool out of it. It's a really fun hobby. I encourage you to check it out. I want you to imagine hunting big game with stone tools. Because that's what went on here for thousands of years. And it's an entirely different way of hunting than the way we do it today. You get as close as you can to the animal, whether it's an elk, a deer, or a bear, and you either hit it with a spear, or a bow and arrow, or you get it with an atlas. And you're not going to take that animal down right away. You're going to injure that animal, and then you're going to have to track it in the snow. This was probably done in the winter months. You're going to track it and track it and track it, if you're lucky, you're going to find it bedded down, still alive. You wound it again with a spear. It gets up, it runs another mile or two. So this was a slow process. I have seen documented hunts with native people taking a week to, until they tracked their animal down, if they got their animal. They're tough animals. Now, they're also injured animals. They can get mighty angry. So not just bear, but elk. You don't want to go walking up on a bull elk that's injured. So that is how the hunting was done for thousands of years. Now my sons pointed out to me, they said, Dad, you kind of make a smirk in that one video, like you're so proud of yourself for making an arrowhead. I'm like, well, I am kind of proud. I made an arrowhead. And they said, Dad, making an arrowhead is one thing. Going out and getting dinner, that's another thing. <laughs> and I realized they're right. I'd be the first guy to starve if we were back using stone tools. Hey, before we leave the subject of stone tools, I love reminding my audiences. Everybody here today is a descendant of humans that used to make stone tools. I find them, especially when I go into high schools and give this talk, 
I, I can see some people get turned off because they're like, well, I'm not an Indian. My ancestors aren't Native American, so we didn't make arrowheads. Whoa, I don't care if you're from Africa, Asia, Europe, wherever your ancestors were from, they didn't always have metal. You go back far enough, you're a descendant of someone who made stone tools. And that's how they got dinner. And you know what, folks? If your ancestors weren't good at making stone tools and getting dinner, you wouldn't exist. <laughs> How's that for making it real? What changed? Why all of a sudden did we have a problem? Well, the first two words in the next slide, I think, sum it up. Market hunting. So I'm going to put on this hat. Represent the old-fashioned market hunters. These were the folks who saw wildlife as dollar signs. This was no longer shooting and killing for food. It was for profit. Sometimes it was for furs. Sometimes it was for the meat. Uh, some animals, it was the tongues, right? The, the plains buffalo, they wanted the hides and the tongues. The rest they often let to rot. And what they would do is they would get these wild meat sources and then take them into the towns like Emporium, like St. Mary's, like Ridgeway, like Carthus. There is no doubt in my mind. Every time I drive on the Quiana Highway to come here, that's the way I come. I pass Carthus, and there's a really cool historical marker about the Carthus Iron Furnace. It went into blast in the 1820s. They were melting iron ore there in Carthus. There is no doubt in my mind that in the 1820s, the majority of the food, the meat that those iron workers were eating was coming out of the woods. It was wild deer, it was turkey, it was bear, and it was elk. Well, there were no game laws whatsoever in that era. You could legally go out and shoot and kill as much as you could. And I know a thing or two about market hunting. Because I want you to look at this picture, and I want you to look for a guy with nice, long, lanky arms like me, big nose like me, big Pennsylvania German ears like me. You guys see him? That's my great granddad, George Wagner. Be my best. <laughs> he was not a market hunter. He was Montour County's first Ford dealer. Ford tractors, mostly. So why do I mention him in my program? Because my great granddad used to hunt with a bunch of old timers. See some of the older folks in that photo? That were market hunters years before. And they used to sit around the camp and tell stories of the old days when they used to market hunt. And the stories have lived on in my family today. We still know these stories. And the stories went like this. They'd go out and the hunters would cut tracks of wildlife in the snow. Let's say elk, deer, bear, whatever they're looking for that makes money. Then they would spread out in a giant killing circle around those tracks, and they would hunt inward, hunting inward, hunting inward, killing anything they came across that they could sell. When they finally all met up and the hunt was over, they split the killings. Now, I'm no linguist, but I would be uh, pretty confident to say that our saying, you know, when you make a lot of money, you make a killing, it's connected right back to these guys. The more you kill, the more money you made. Now, any good school teacher can see that look in an audience's eyes when their eyes start to gloss over. They've been talked at for too long. It doesn't matter how good the subject is. I know when it's time to pick up the guitar. <laughs> in the classroom, that's usually when the phones come out and they start texting. Well, listen, with this next song, I think you're going to really appreciate the video footage you're about to see. Uh, never been released to the public as far as I know. It's old growth Pennsylvania logging footage that you're about to see. And you'll notice I'm changing gears now. This story is a lot more complex than just market hunters. The story is market hunters, but it's also land use history. So with that, I'm gonna take you into the logging camps with the cross cuts. <laughs> It was over and Mr. Lincoln had won. I drew my Navy wages and returned to my home. Sullivan County, where my grandfather came. The soil rocky and skies always rain. I remember Grandpa's stories of when he was a kid. Bison in the lowlands and elk on the ridge. Well, now they're all gone and a new hunt has begun to find the tired dot and make the sawmills home. All I need is my crosscut saw, my double bit axe and 80 trees to fall. The spring is coming, I can smell it all around. 
And my soul's being tempted by that high water sound Up on the loyal sock, well it's straight and it's tall There's pine up there like you ain't never saw Only brave loggers bear the winter's cold The snow falls heavy on the Appalachian fold Oh, up in the morning at 5 a.m. Throw down some biscuits, some coffee and ham A 12-hour shift on the Teamster crew Skidding logs through the river, through the ice and snow All I need is my cross-cut saw My double-bit axe and 80 trees to fall The spring, it's coming, I can smell it all around My soul's being tempted by that high water sound We lash our logs together with hickory and oak No rope, no iron, just pins and bows A sweep at the front and back and a shack for the crew Twenty thousand board feet Ready to tie loose when the ice finally breaks and the water's good and high. We'll head down the loyal sock, our crew of five. One day on the raft down to Montoursville, we hit the Susquehanna where the water's smooth and still. All I need is my cross cut saw, my double bit axe, and 80 trees to fall. The spring, it's coming, I can smell it all around And my soul's being tempted by that high water sound Once we get to Marietta, we sell off our logs One hundred dollars split by five river hogs We head back north, walking all the way One hand on your knife and the other on your pay Well, if it's a good season, we'll have two or three more runs Then this year is over and the summer begun I'll watch as the rust, it builds on my tools And long for the day I'm back with my logging crew All I need is my cross cut saw My double bit axe and 80 trees to fall The spring it's coming, I can smell it all around My soul's being tempted by that high water sound sure you understand why I've now shifted gears. Why did we go from talking market hunting to now talking about cutting trees down? Elk traditionally were browsers here in Pennsylvania. And I say traditionally because in about 10 or 15 minutes in the program you're going to hear me talk about how their diet has shifted slightly. Browse means they're eating tree buds, right? They're eating the, the ends of the branches. Well, good luck getting your belly filled when you're a browser when the forest starts looking like this. Now, I know that's our neighboring state, West Virginia. Well, here's a Pennsylvania picture if you prefer. By the mid-1800s, 1850s and into the 1860s, we began industrially harvesting every tree we could make a buck off. Let me rephrase that. Every tree we could make a penny off of. I mean, it was all about one-time profits. This was not what we do nowadays where we try to manage sustainably and we try to make a little profit but also take care of future generations. Huh. The way we used to harvest timber was anything worth a penny or more, take it. So they took the white pine, that's going into the sawmills for lumber. Your state tree, the what? Eastern hemlock. The bark was used to make leather, right? You make tannic acid, so the bark was going into the tanneries. Where are all the hardwoods going? Underground. Prop timber in the mines, the coal mines, the clay mines. That's what's holding up the roofs, the, hard, the hardwoods. Uh, how about the aspen and the birch and the little stuff? Oh, well, that's also going, in some cases, to the mines for laggings to hold up bad ceiling, but also into the paper mills, the wood alcohol factories, 
They utilized everything until the forest was literally stripped for thousands of acres. Now, it's a good time to pause and make sure you don't get the wrong message from what I'm trying to say to you. I am not trying to say the word logger is a dirty word. No. That's not the point. In fact, you're looking at a logger, folks. I haven't always been a school teacher. I've been in and out of the woods my whole life. Logging is a wonderful, sustainable industry nowadays. At least it should be. In the 1850s, it was different. In the 1850s and 60s and 70s, it was cut everything. Who cares about the future? And if we wreck the land, there's always Ohio. <laughs> if we wreck Ohio, there's always Michigan. And it just went west and kept going until they hit the Pacific Ocean. So when that's what was going on to the forest around here, good luck getting enough food for your browsers. I had audiences ask me, they say, okay, Wagner, what's worse, the market hunting you had talked about or the logging? I'm not sure which one was worse, but can we both agree they were freight trains on a collision course for this next slide? By the 1870s, the elk was gone from the wild in Pennsylvania. I don't know if you want to blame the market hunters or if you want to blame the loggers or who you want to blame, but they're all part of that same end result. By the 1870s, the elk was gone. Now you might notice I don't give the name of a hunter. I don't give an exact date. That's intentional. There's two reasons I don't do that. Number one, especially when I'm in schools doing this program, I think it would be a mistake uh, to pretend, first of all, that I know the answer of who shot the last hunter or the last elk. You know why? The history books don't agree. Pick up a Clearfield County history book. They got one person shooting the last elk. And then you pick up the elk county history books, and they say somebody else shot the last elk. Won't even bring up Center County. So you got that mess of who actually did shoot the last elk. But now I want to give you the more important reason. I think it would be a mistake to tell audiences, oh, well, it was John Smith on 1873 on such and such mountain. Because here's why, folks. Then they will leave my program thinking, oh, well, it wasn't our fault that the elk went extinct. It was John Smith's fault. He shot the last elk. Ladies and gentlemen, we all shot the last elk. That's kind of my argument. We as a society in the 1870s, the way we used to view nature, we all pulled the trigger on the last elk. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. So we're totally out of balance. That whole talk I gave you in the beginning about Native Americans only harvesting what they could eat, that's now out the window. Nature was viewed as a one-time bag of money. Cash it in. Cash it in. Now I'm going to change hats to one of my favorites. I love putting this one on. This is an old school Pennsylvania coal mining hat. And you can't talk about the story of elk if we're not going to also bring up coal. And by the way, when I say old school, this is like Civil War era. This is the old whale blubber burning lamps. This is before the carbide that your granddad hunted raccoons with. This is the old stuff. So we've got the story of coal as well. It needs to be touched on really for two reasons. First is the negative. It left some land scarred that did not help the story of elk. Not sure it was as detrimental as logging, but the coal mining industry definitely left the land impaired. You want an example? Look under your feet. You're on an old abandoned strip mine. I don't know if you know. This whole mountain was stripped for coal. Didn't always look green. A lot of work went into making this mountain look green again. Now here we have soft coal, right? Bituminous coal. And of course, another part of the coal, you get the story of acid mine drainage. I know you've all seen creeks that look like this. I'll tell you a true story. When I was taking my Schuylkill County kids, high school kids from Schuylkill County, I was taking them on a field trip once. One of my high school kids, when we got out of the coal region, said, Mr. Wagner, what's wrong with the creeks around here? How come they're not orange? <laughs> Folks, he wasn't being a smart aleck. He had never been out of the coal region. Every creek this poor kid had ever seen was orange. Well, obviously, this is not what creeks are supposed to look like. Now, i got to pause. I had an elk biologist say to me, Van, be careful what you're telling people. Don't, don't tell people this stuff is killing elk, because I have watched elk drink that stuff. I said, really? He said, I have watched them go up and drink that garbage, and it doesn't seem to hurt them. His name's John. So I said, John, all right, here's my analogy I'll use to you. I teach high school. I see high school kids that drink Monster and Red Bull and all that garbage. It doesn't seem to kill them either, but I'm not sure it's not going to do them any favors when they're 30, 40, 50 years old. And we agreed on that subject. So I guess my argument is this. It might not kill the elk right away when it drinks it, but if you have an impaired ecosystem that looks like that or like that, that is in no way helping the story of elk. If it's injuring the ecosystem, it's going to come back to hurt the patient. That's how I look at it. 
Now, this tells me where you're from. Some people call those comb banks. Some call them bony piles. Now, I'd be willing to bet my fellow Danvillians would call them comb banks, because over in Shemokin, they've got the comb banks. But I'd be willing to bet those of you that came in from the western part of the state, you call them bony piles. And I've already figured out even more I can say about you. The, the coal bank people, they drink something called soda, and they eat something called a whoopie pie, and they root for the eagles. The, the, the bony pile people, they eat this strange thing called a gob, and they wash it down with this mysterious substance called pop, and they cheer for the Steelers. <laughs> I'm in between. I go for the Ravens because they're in my watershed. That's where the Susquehanna River goes, the Chesapeake. I got to go for the same. So hold that thought because, to be honest with you, I'm not here to necessarily put a very big black eye on the story of coal because if we're going to talk about elk, the coal, the story of coal actually comes back to do a lot of good for the elk. So let's switch gears here and get into the story of conservation. Because this is really the part of the story I love getting to. Let's get past all the negative part. Let's get past all the bad news. Let's get into the good news. By the 1890s, some minds were changing in America. Some, some people were, were starting to realize, hey, if we take care of our natural resources, then we can enjoy them, and future generations can enjoy them. So my first hero of conservation that I like to really is Dr. Joseph Rothrock. He was Pennsylvania's first commissioner of forestry. I just want to impress upon you what a new idea this was. Until 1895, there was no such thing as forestry. It was cut everything and cash in and move on. Thanks to the foresight of people like Dr. Joseph Rothrock, they said, hey, you know what? If we manage the forest, we can cut a couple trees, make a few dollars, but then let the forest grow back, and our kids can go and cut a few trees, and then let it grow back, and our grandkids, this is what you and I now call sustainable forestry. I just want to make sure you, you understand what a huge shift in mindset that was. So I can't imagine I'm blowing anyone's mind with that, you know, the idea of sustainable forestry. I'd be willing to bet nine out of ten of you here are like, well, that's what we do, that's common sense. Right, in the 1890s though, that was revolutionary. To, to say, wait a minute, don't cut everything, you know, that, that was revolutionary. What else was revolutionary? Well, in 1895, we created laws to protect wildlife. What? You can't just shoot them all anymore? And guess what? I, I love this part of the story, too. Guess who asked for the game commission to be created? Hunters. It was sportsmen that stepped up and said, hey, if we don't come up with some guidelines here, we're not only going to have lost the moose and the elk, we're going to lose everything. The white-tailed deer, the grouse, the turkey, the bear, you name it. There'll be nothing left here. And so we created the Game Commission in 1895, sportsmen and women, to protect wildlife. So can you kind of see where I'm going with this? We've now got a change in public opinion, which is going to be fertile ground for bringing back elk. And I think it's important to point out that that change in mindset very well might be the most important part of this whole program. Or I would argue the story would go like this. If we hadn't changed public opinion, the story would sound like this. In 1913, we got a bunch of elk from the Rocky Mountains and brought them back on a train and released them in Ridgeway and St. Mary's and Emporium. And in 1914, we shot them all. <laughs> That's how the story would have played out if we didn't have this change in mindset. So let's talk about 1913. We go out to the Rockies and we pick up 177 elk. Some of the elk did come from game farms here in Pennsylvania, but the majority of our elk came from the rock. Now, if you were coming late, I want to make sure you hear something I said earlier in my program. We now know, by studying DNA and genetics, we now have realized that the elk in the Rocky Mountains are the same species of elk that used to be here in Pennsylvania. What I just said contradicts almost every book published, because the books are already two, two or three years outdated. This is brand new information coming out from the biologists and the geneticists saying these, these were the same elk, same species of elk. So our elk were released, not just here, it wasn't just Elk County. Some were released in Center County near State College, some down in the Laurel Highlands near Somerset. Uh, we had some near Philadelphia in Lee Heighton. And surprise, surprise, the only place they really hung on in this area, Elk County, Cameron County, Clinton County, Clearfield. So they were taken all over the place and released all through the teens. And, you know, I think this picture says a lot. 
the forest was bouncing back, but it wasn't bounced back yet. You know, it was still a very fragile ecosystem. And you can practically count the ribs on this poor cow. You know, they weren't thriving yet. They were existing, but they weren't thriving. So the next picture doesn't surprise me at all. What would a starving elk do? Come into town. Because you've got corn and soybeans, and you've got a lush yard, and you've got roses and all the other things that I can come into town and eat. That was a problem. And through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s especially, we had a tremendous amount of problems where the elk are coming into town and getting into trouble. Has that problem gone away? No, I'm sorry to say it's still part of the story of elk. In fact, I was embarrassed quite a bit. Last month I was here doing this program, and I, I talked up how we've really done a much better job of keeping the elk out of town, and we left, and there was a huge bull right down Ben is that just power, power, and a kid in the car in front of me who had been in my program rolled the window down and goes, Mister, you said there wouldn't be any elk in town. We're, we've, got, we've got some improvement to make, that's for sure, but we've come a long way, because this was the norm. This was the norm. They were in town all the time getting in trouble. And so, come the 1920s, some hunting was brought back. Um, some, you know, some, some of the hunting was a result of crop damage and things like that, and some was just sportsmen saying, hey, let us take advantage of the species that's bounced bounce back. But by 31, 1931, they stopped that hunt. They said, eh, we don't have enough elk for us to continue an elk. So let's talk about how many elk there were. Look at this number. This is amazing. 1920 through the 1970s, most experts agree that I've interviewed that we had less than 100 elk. I can go even more shocking for you. Several biologists I've talked to said, you know what? For some of those years, we were down to 20 animals. 20 animals in the whole state of Pennsylvania. Now, if you know anything about biology, fast forward a few years to now, we have some serious inbreeding concerns. <laughs> but we can get to that in the future. We can, we can worry about that. 20 animals or less. I had a couple here yesterday. And they said, we, in 1964, got married and honeymooned here in Benazette. <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, next time you think, you know, that you need to go to Hawaii or something, just remember that, you know, it's a happy couple who started their marriage in Benazette. But here's what they said to me. They said, when we came in 1964, the locals told us there were 12 elk in, in the immediate area. 12. They had a name. So, we, we were not the thriving elk area we are today. <laughs> What changed? Well, I get to put on another one of my favorite hats. Sportsmen to the rescue again. Because in the 1970s and certainly into the 80s, sportsmen were calling, they were calling folks to action. They were saying, listen, we've only got 100 or fewer elk, and those 100 or fewer elk are causing all kinds of problems. They're always downtown. They're in the farmer's fields. What can be done about it? Science to the rescue. Science. Biology. This is the first time we ever even studied the elk. Starting in the 70s and 80s, the Bureau of Forestry, what you and I now call BCNR, Bureau of Forestry started an elk survey, trying to understand a little bit about the elk. How many are there? Where do they go in the daytime? Where do they go at nighttime? Where are they eating? These kinds of questions had never really been studied. And what came out of that research was fascinating. What we found is the elk, they can live in the forest, barely but they would thrive on grasses and clovers and sedges and all the grazing habitat that you're going to see promoted here today. That came out of that study starting in the 70s and 80s. So I call these the big three. These are the three partners that really, I think, deserve the majority of the credit for bringing the elk out of that 100 plateau to where we are today. You've got the Game Commission, of course, who's in charge of all of our both game and non-game mammal and bird species. You got DCNR, which used to be Bureau of Forestry. They're in charge of state forests, state parks, and whatnot. Can anyone tell me RMEF? Here. Uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Rocky Mountain Elk Federation. Or Foundation, pardon me. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. That's private money. So my point is you've got, you've got public efforts, public efforts, private efforts, all coming together to take that research that talked about where the elk are, where they thrive, where they don't thrive, and try to come up with a solution. Well, let's go back to the coal. Back to the story of coal with this map. This is a random uh, topographic map of elk range. This is in Clearfield County mostly. It truly was random at this. I, I, I basically just took a random chunk of this part of Pennsylvania and I looked at the topographic maps. And here's what you'll see. Green, which means trees or wild areas. 
Look at all the reddish pink. Strip mines. That, those are abandoned coal mine lands. I doubt I'm surprising too many of you. I mean, most Pennsylvanians know we are covered in abandoned strip mines. But did you ever realize how much? I mean, what would you estimate? That's about half of that map. About half of that earth has been blasted and bulldozed, and in most cases, abandoned. And so, back to that research, the grassland research, the elk-like grazing, the idea was put forth of, hey, can we clean up some of those abandoned lands? Can we make them habitat and do a win-win? Clean up an abandoned mine, which benefits the public, but also provide wildlife with habitat. And I would argue if you're starting with an area that looks like this, you can only do better. <laughs> but when you're dealing with this, that's not habitat. I mean, nothing wants to live there. And so you can only improve it by going in. The first thing we contour the land. Bulldoze the, bulldoze the land back to something other than a cliff and a pit. Uh, which is not only making it more natural, it's making it safer. I'm sure many of you have read the news. Every couple months, sadly, somebody in Pennsylvania is hurt or killed in abandoned mines. There's a big problem, though. There's no topsoil. So here's how they solved that problem. I want you to look at the second tractor, product of the paper mills in Johnsonburg. Dom, Dom Tar Paper said, hey, we've got this organic woody pulp that we're sending to landfills, paying money to call it garbage. But they said, it's, it's safe. It's harmless. It's they spread this stuff about an inch thick, and it made for excellent topsoil when you don't have it. And as the pictures show, in a matter of weeks, in some cases, it's green. Now, it's always good to stop and pause and say, wait a minute now. I, I, I don't want you to think I'm up here going, see, we made it better than it ever was. Give me an old growth hemlock white pine mixed deciduous forest any day over that. But folks, that's not what we, we inherited. We inherited those ugly, black, scarred, comb banks, bony piles. That's what we inherited from the old days. I would say that's a step in the right direction. And you know what? The elk hammer it. They love it. They love it. Now, they're proving me wrong today because everybody keeps looking out and the elk aren't out. When you drive around this area and you're looking for elk, sure, you'll see them in the woods now and then, laying down on a hot day in the shade. But you know where you're going to see the herds of 70, 80 elk? In the fields. Okay, I saw something just like this on my way here to the pavilion today, just up the road. Okay, I was rubbernecking and I look over and I saw a field covered in polka dots. All right, there they are. Uh, I believe when, when Mark Greitzer gave me that picture, he said he counted 97 elk in that photo. Folks, that was an abandoned mine two years before the photo was taken. I cannot think of another example of any wildlife species where we have seen that kind of drastic bounce back where you can take some abandoned lands, try to turn it into habitat, and almost overnight you get those kind of results. So I asked Mark Grazer, I said, Mark, I, I need to know from my audiences, is that like sensational? Is that, is that why you took the photo? He goes, man, if I drive by that field between 5 and 7 a.m., most mornings it looks like that, when the, when the, when the vegetation is lush. Uh, and, and I like this because he just simply took a pencil map and he just drew approximately where the elk were in the 70s. You guys are right about here. Here's Benazet. Want to see where we are today? It's expanding. My program. It's about grassland. It's about habitat. It's as simple as this. Where you have abandoned mine lands that are being reclaimed and turned into lush vegetation, you could expect to see elk and other species take advantage of that. Are they coming for your petunias? It takes a lot of food to feed an 800 pound bull elk. So I would refer back to my previous statement. If you don't have acres and acres of habitat, I really don't expect you to start having herds of elk showing up. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. They go where the food is. And we grow them big here in Pennsylvania. This is my elkosaurus photo. Big elk. That's either a really big elk or the Game Commission funding for transportation has gotten really small for their WCOs. No, obviously the elk's closer to the camera than the truck is. I threw this in there not just for humor, but I wanted to make an important point as we start to gear up to close. I want you audience members to know that Pennsylvania elk are world class, especially the bulls. The bulls that we grow around here are world class. You should take some pride in that. I mean, some, some of the bulls are record setters for North America. You want some great proof? I'll give you a great local proof. Every year, we take one tag for killing a bull. It's called the governor's tag. And it gets auctioned off for conservation fundraiser purposes. 
and the, the high bidder gets a chance to go out and shoot a bull. This year's governor's tag sold for, I think, $45,000, and the high bidder was from the state of Washington, where they have elk in their backyards. My point is, if somebody out in the Rocky Mountains, well, they're not exactly the Rockies, if someone on the West Coast where they have elk is willing to pay $45,000 for a chance to get one of your elk, that ought to tell you something about how world famous they are. The science is ongoing. There's a few things I want to draw to your attention in this photo. One is just the fact that the science is ongoing. Study them in the 80s and then stop. We are still trying to monitor the herd, making sure we have a healthy herd, monitoring the, the biology of it. But I also want you to look at the background in the photo. You see some cars, some houses. We continue to have some animals that just haven't gotten the memo. They just keep coming into town. And I, I, I don't know that we can make the claim that that'll ever totally go away. But the way we're trying to address that problem more of those and better food on those. I'm pointing, I don't know if you realize it, that's an abandoned strip mine over there. You're not only on an abandoned strip mine, that field is an abandoned coal mine that's now filled with yummy grass and clover and stuff the elk and the deer and the turkeys want to eat. So the idea is put more of those food plots farther away from Benazet and St. Mary's, put them back in the game lands and on the state forest, and that's where the bellies will go. That's where the tummies are going to be. The elk will go where the food is. Might you still get the occasional problem elk that has to be dealt with? Occasionally, yeah. But we should celebrate this fact. Remember when I said we used to have about 100 elk? Okay. I can't give you the number, but I've, I've read the, back when we had about 100 elk, we used to have several hundred cases of, of problems per year where the elk were dealing with crop damage, they're in people's yards, they're, they're scaring kids waiting for a bus. Can you picture a kindergartner and an 800 pound bull? That's not a good mix. I mean, the Game Commission was constantly dealing with problems in the 1970s. Those problems have gone way down, and we're now somewhere at around 1,000 elk. I can't give you an exact number. I believe the last formal census was up in the high 800s, meaning they actually counted 800 elk heads. Uh, you, you maybe could double that number. Maybe, maybe there were, for every one we counted, we missed one. Maybe we have 15 or 1,600 elk. We have a lot. Yet the number of complaints is dropping. And we continue to see it drop the more of those we put out there. And this makes us the envy of the other states. In 2001, we have sportsmen and women harvesting elk again. And that's an important part of the management of any wildlife. Uh, we have some areas where the density of the herd is, is too high. And those are the areas we can target. And it's a win-win. We can get good wildlife management by targeting some of those high population areas and removing a few animals. But it's also a win for sportsmen and women who get a chance to talk about a chance in a lifetime. They get a chance to go out and harvest one of these trophy Pennsylvania bulls or cows. Uh, my friends back home in Danville, they're like, so you're doing this gig with the Game Commission. Do you, like, get a tag? No, I don't get a tag. I got a free hat, but um, <laughs> I do not get an elk tag. Here's how it works in a nutshell. When you buy your hunter's license in Pennsylvania, you have a chance for a few extra dollars to have your name thrown into a hat. It's a digital hat. And uh, this year, I believe there were 80-some tags pulled from the hat out of approximately 25,000 that put their names in the hat. Now, I still put my name in that hat every year. And you might say, well, that's foolish. With odds like that, why would you put your money in there? Here's why, folks. The few extra dollars you put in that hat are going to help fix up these abandoned mine lands and make habitat. They're going to pay for six foot five banjo guitar players to do programs around Pennsylvania. <laughs> My point is, the money goes to a good cause. It's going to wildlife conservation. And that is how we're going to continue to clean up these abandoned mine lands. I wish I could tell you, oh, good news, we're done. The mines are all cleaned up. As you all know, we've got plenty of orange creeks around here. We've got plenty of fields of black. So the sky is the limit for improvement. You'll never thank everybody. But with this slide, I simply wanted to draw attention to the fact of the diversity of sportsmen and women groups. This is a little bit more deep than just saying, well, the Game Commission and the Bureau of Forestry and Rocky Mountain Elk fixed it. There's a lot of folks that deserve recognition, a lot of groups. And I hope all of you have taken a chance to visit the facility right up the road. Eka, Keystone Elk Country Alliance. That's a partnership. You got DCNR, you got private donors all working together, state-of-the-art facility. <laughs> I'm going to close with a song I love singing. It never gets old to me because it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's a song called The Woolrich Coat. 
And I'll tell you why I wrote it, folks. I wrote this song thinking of the guy who inspired me to love wildlife, and that's Dad. When I see a Woolrich coat, that red and black plaid, I'm wearing the shirt now, I think of Dad. It takes me right back to being a kid, going pheasant hunting, deer hunting, just hiking, camping. And so here's why I close my program with this song. I think it's a great chance for my audience members, you guys, to take a moment as I'm singing this and say a few words of thanks in your own mind for whoever it was in your life that helped you to appreciate nature. Because you obviously do or you wouldn't be sitting on this pavilion on this cold rainy day up here. You obviously get it. old for the first time hunting with his dad he flips his collar up to stop the cold with his red and black plaid in a drizzling rain it grows heavy as a stone he's keeping warm he's got his father's wool rich coat I thank Dad for the memories and Woolrich for the coat. Hanging on the wall with a patch on the breast. Smells of mothballs and the old cedar chest. My favorite is the game pouch on the back Feathers from a pheasant or a good rope to drag I thank Dad for the memories and Woolrich for the coat Fall days, wake early, put on that wool. Slip my hands in the pockets by the ribs and go for a stroll. And so it goes for years, daughters and sons. Mr. Rich's coat keeps warm, those who keep it on. I thank Dad for the memories and Woolrich for the coat. I thank Dad for the memories and Woolrich for the coat.